you didn't even consider screenwriting until you until you read uh, Sid Field's book in college. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't know anything about it. You know, I just loved film and uh, I was actually into the acting thing. And uh, yeah. I was looking for an excuse to take uh, to do theater at college. My fo- my folks wouldn't let me pick up a major, so uh, I found that the school had a film and theater department. So I figured, well, maybe if I can major in film, then I can get to do the theater stuff. And uh, this was back in, God, when was this, 90, 91. And uh, I think the Sid Field book was the only screenwriting book that existed at that point. You know, now there's, there's about a yeah. thousand. But <laughs> you know, back then, that was basically it. And um, There are whole sections now in the bookstore devoted to it. Yeah, yeah. the whole bookstore is devoted to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, yeah. You know, picked it up, and and I'd never seen a screenplay before, and I was just sort of uh, intrigued by the whole thing, and I just ended up kind of taking a crack at uh, at the the book I was reading at the time, and that's sort of what set the whole thing off. Now, had you been kind of a creative writer prior to that, or writing couldn't have been a foreign idea to you, was it? No, it wasn't foreign. No, I, I'd been writing short stories for a while. I was uh, when I grew up, I was really into. Steve King and Peter Straub and Ray Bradbury and Alfred Hitchcock and you know just kind of the the cool creepy stuff and uh, right. so I always sort of had the bug to tell the scary stories and I grew up in an area where uh, where that stuff kind of flourished too so it was always sort of around and I would write short stories you know I almost got kicked out of grade school because the nuns were a little worried by some of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was always out there you know it was just I never really sort of made the connection to uh, to film with it, and uh, you know, once I started, I just sort of fell in love with the whole thing. Yeah, uh, and and of course, we we came to know you from obviously the Grudge. But what was the journey leading up to that? How did that come about? Uh, to the Grudge has a long journey. I mean, the the, the Grudge was my twenty fifth script. Um, oh goodness, you know, twenty fifth. Twenty fifth. Yeah. Oh wow! Um, some guys, guys get some guys get their first movie made. Some guys get their twenty fifth. No, but that's great. I mean that's. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people just wouldn't last that long. That's, I'm, dude, I'm, I'm really impressed with um, that you would do that. That's because a lot of people, after one or two in this day and age, just quit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's you deserve an award for that, the endurance right there. <laughs> I'm not making this I'll up. As if, if there's an award, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's funny. It's just I, I think it's one of those industries where you know the, the people who people you end up meeting up with always sort of have a similar story of, of you know, hanging onto the edge of the boat longer than everybody else. Right. You know, I mean, the, 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 the story is about the people who crack a home run with their first their first one. That's a short list, you know. I was, it's funny, I was, I had the discussion the other day, actually, with somebody who I was talking to, and they didn't know that, they thought The Sixth Sense was M. Night Shyamalan's first script and first movie and everything. And, no, that's not uh, at all. No, it, no, it took a little while, you know, and, and that's just sort of, the way it goes, but yeah, I mean, the, the grudge was my it was my twenty fifth. It was my um, I think what was it? It's my thirteenth or fourteenth professional gig. I've been writing for I I got my first job uh, professionally in in nineteen ninety six, oh, okay. um, and had a, had a bunch of films that uh, you know a lot of close calls, a lot of movies that had blinking green lights and mm-hmm. actors attached and directors attached, and you know just for one reason or the other they they didn't go. So it. Uh, it took quite some time, and, and uh, it, it's interesting because the, the grudge sort of came about when I was in this zone where I, I'd been working in Hollywood for, I guess, six and a half years at that point, and I sort of said, I think I want to kind of find some projects that I can have a little bit more control over. Because once they get into the studio system, you know, you never know what's going to happen. As a right. writer, you don't really have any control. And yeah. there were sort of two projects at that point that I said, um, I'm going to find a way to, to do these two. And the first one was, Grudge, and the second one was Red, ironically enough. Uh, oh. And those are the only three movies I've had made to date. So it's funny how things work out. Excuse me, Steve. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, during this time, um, did you do any script doctoring? Were you ever hired as a script doctor? I've only done a couple of those, actually. Um, I've, I've, you know, I've gotten hired to rewrite scripts, um, generally sort of larger scale rewrites. I, I'm not a, I don't do a lot of that. Um, right. And I've only done a little bit of doctoring like where they they sort of pay you to come in for a week or two and mm-hmm. um and just kind of punch one thing or another up uh which you know it's good work if you can get it it's it's that's what i hear it's highly specialized well yeah i mean you, you hear the stories about the a-list guys who get you know a quarter of a million dollars a week or guaranteed four weeks <laughs> yeah. just right to, you know work on dialogue and you know actually my experience was more of the opposite early on 
you know, I would I would get fired off of projects because I turned in a really good draft, and, and then they wanted to give it to one of those A-list guys for a week so that then they could call. In one case, it was Julia Roberts, um, and say, we, we have a script we think you'd be perfect for, and, you know, this so-and-so is, is doing dialogue work. Because, you know, if they gave it to her and said, hey, Steve Susco's wrote it, she'd be like, who the hell is that? <laughs> you know, so, so that that happens a lot, you know, just just to help uh, – help uh, producers get uh, the talent attached as well but so, yeah most of my experience has been the, the person who was rewritten um, I, I i would imagine that it takes a tough skin to be a screenwriter because as as you said there's there's the uh, there's the, you know they option your script and it never comes to fruition or 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 they they take your script and they and they play with it and change it around i mean it it, it has to take a tough skin doesn't it yeah absolutely absolutely i mean unless you just you know, you're fine sending your children out into the world, not caring about them. I mean, you know, yeah. as a screenwriter, once you once you either sell a project or get hired to write a project, the first thing you do is you sign away your copyright. So, you know, in fact, oh. I think the first sentence of the first document that that you end up signing, uh, in one sentence, says both I am the sole author of this work and I am no longer the author of this work. The studio is the yeah. author of this work, um, wow. and you're sort of immediately expendable. And uh, you know, you can, like I said, you could turn in. You could get fired for turning in a great draft as easily as you could get fired for turning in a shitty draft. Mm, right. right. So yeah, it, it's a, it's definitely tough. I mean, you know, there's there's pros and cons to anything, and there's you know, it's not the easiest business to be in. But what's, uh, what's the sure is what's fun. the yeah what's the greatest lesson you've learned about about uh, screenwriting when you got started? Let well, the thick skin was a big one, you know, yeah. and 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 uh, and that it was, you know, it, it's it's a longer road than a lot of people think. Um, and uh, and to sort of take it as if it's a marathon, not a sprint, you know, not to right. expect kind of an overnight thing, and just to uh, to be in it for the right reasons, you know. I think that it's definitely um, a kind of situation where if you don't really love writing and and the creative act of actually writing a script, whether you're doing it for free as a spec or whether you're getting paid to do it, um, the, loving that part of it is paramount to anything because everything else is can be so tough, it's such a shitty business sometimes, that if you don't at least love what you're doing, you're in trouble. You know, you go crazy. <laughs> right. I can imagine. Really but don't you so find that you it's... just have to, you know, I learned really quickly that it's, you know, uh, and I always loved writing, so I was pretty secure up front. I think for me it was sort of a question of can I, do I love it enough to kind of put up with all the, the bullshit? Mm-hmm. Well, you have to have kind of two different disciplines, I, I, I would think, because you have to love the kind of the isolation of it. It's you and the page, and you're all alone with it. And then on the other hand, you have to be open to the collaborative aspect of it when it's when it's all said and done. I would yeah, think. yeah. I think that's what a lot of people forget when they sort of start experimenting with with the business is that it, you're not writing a book. <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah. an extraordinarily collaborative <laughs> medium, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I I agree with everyone who says that the screenplay itself is a is a certain artistic element and and is a certain kind of finished product. But I you know I also agree with people who say it, it's you know it is not entirely a finished product because it's it's sort of a blueprint for something else. That's yeah, yeah. That it takes a lot more people to do. So you know I I think you need to sort of be able to look at it with both hats. Um, and uh, right. I mean at least that that's sort of where I find my comfort zone. Is there a challenge? Is there a specific challenge in writing uh, the horror genre compared to others? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think <laughs> horror is, is one of the hardest genres to uh, to come by in Hollywood because it's, you know, I think if you you guys are you guys are horror geeks, right? We're what? You guys, you guys are horror geeks, right? I mean, you oh yes, love, like yeah. We're, we're, we're geeks really, about everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're geeks I, about I everything. Not just horror, but everything really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's you know you go back and you look at the best horror films, the one of, that that have really stood the test of time, whether they were huge hits or not at, at the time that they were released. And generally, what they all have in common is that they're really unique and out of the box. And right. I firmly believe that that's that's a certain element that horror has that I don't think a lot of the other genres really have to cope with in the same way. I think the reason good horror films are scary is because they're new. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, look, you, you can put anybody in a dark room and you can blare them with sound and, you know, you can make them jump and, and that's that's great and, you know, that's one of the fun things about horror. Horror is great. It's, it's a fun 90-minute yeah. exorcism. But I think for the, the truly, truly amazing horror films, 
they have something so much richer. The the thing that you know, it's not over when the lights come up. It follows you home, and you're you're afraid to look in the back of your car, and you know you can't sleep, and you have to check all your closets. And I mean, that's the stuff that I really love. Is the horror that shoots a little bit higher. And well, tell me about it. Twenty years after watching the original Chainsaw Massacre, it still it still yeah. it still lingers with me. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so so let's talk a little bit about uh, about Red. Uh, you, you said that this you wrote you wrote the, the script for this years ago. Yeah. Um, and it's based on a Jack Ketchum work. Uh, uh, well, according to the trailer, it's based on the book by Jack Ketchum. <laughs> it's the first time in my life I've ever seen a trailer with a typo in it. Oh my word! Yeah, uh, we've we've covered his properties a, a couple of times here on the show, and this this one seems uh, a little a bit of a change of pace for him and for you. And, uh, it's not like a str- it's, we're not talking straight out horror genre here. It's 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 very character based, isn't it? It is. I, I think it's certainly a horror film. If you're if if you're the lead and you're going through what yes. he's going through, but right. it's it's absolutely not a horror movie, no. Um, yeah. And uh, it's funny. This book actually was my introduction to Jack Ketchum. Uh, I, I I saw it on the stands, and uh, you know it had the shadow of a of a man holding a bloody axe, and it said they killed the wrong man's dog. And I grabbed it and said, Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> for me. And. Uh, <laughs> And it was it was entirely not what they sold. It, it was yeah. this really powerful slow burn character dramatic thriller, um, very much sort of in the vein of a Straw Dogs, uh, mm-hmm. and it had these really interesting moral and ethical questions, and it had this really powerful kind of societal viewpoint and, and generational viewpoint and the difference between generations. And it just kind of blew me out of my seat. It was one of those things that I finished it and I went right back and started it over. It's, it's, it's not a very long book. And uh, it, it's just an incredibly powerful story. And it was something I wanted to, you know, I knew right away I wanted to get involved in. And uh, it, it actually, you know, then, of course, I, I said, oh, i got to get all Jack's other stuff. And I bought it all. And it's an it's all completely different from red. <laughs> so I, yeah. I kind of started with a different one. Yeah, it's it feels almost like uh, almost in the Stephen King canon. It feels almost like Stephen King's Stand by Me compared to all of his other horror, horror works mm-hmm. because yeah. we we cover the girl next door and, and that's about as horrific as as you can get. Yeah. As you yeah. Can get. yeah. Uh, cool movie. I saw, yeah, it really is. And we saw red. Uh, I saw red last night actually. And uh, I was blown away by it, and uh, particularly by the performance from Brian Cox, uh, yeah. who's just in- incredible. You can't get better than that. Yeah, how, how I mean, did one, one of the best it? moments I've had in the last couple of years was was learning that they cast him. You know, that was that was just extraordinary because I've I'm, I've always been a huge fan of his, and uh, it made me feel a lot better about the whole thing. Oh yeah, and he has such a, I mean, it's built in such a gravitas about him. You know, such a. Uh, an emotional weight about him. Yeah. Uh, was he brought on early on, or uh, how did he come uh, aboard? No, not not early on. I mean, the project had a very very long development process. Uh, I teamed up with Lucky back in. God, I got to go through my notes. I mean, it was it was probably early 2003 that um, mm. that we sort of sat down for the first time, and uh, you know, the film didn't get into production until uh, late 2006. Uh, and had a lot of ups and downs. You know, it was it was even set up at United Artists for a little while, and and then they sort of went through their transition, and it fell out over there. Um, I, so I, I think that he was brought in probably once the money was in place um, in you know the early part of 2006. I was actually, um, I think it started to come together when I was over in Japan for Grudge Two. Uh, mm. So I missed a little bit of it. Well, it's got aside from Brian Cox, it's kind of fantastic. Cast uh, Tom Sizemore, Amanda Plummer, Robert England. I mean, on and on. Ken Ashley Dickens, Lawrence, on and on. Yeah, from Hellraiser. I mean, it's it's funny. It's got this kind of yeah. interesting collection of horror folks. You know, even Cox, who was in the ring. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. That's right. It's funny. And, yeah. Uh, and Angela um, Mattis was originally in it too, I believe. T- tell me about. Uh, uh, the, the, we got, went over the basic plot. General, basically. These three young teens are involved in, a, in a, sh- a shooting of of his beloved dog that's been his only company for for many many years. Uh, and, and where does it where does it go from that? What what kind of themes is it exploring with that? Well, you know, it, it's about a guy who uh, has had a very difficult life, uh, fought in the Korean War, and had some really profoundly 
horrific experiences in the war and uh ended up losing his uh his wife and son under incredibly tragic circumstances mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. sort of has nothing left really in his life except for this 14 year old dog that his wife gave him for his 50th birthday mm-hmm. and you know so when the dog is shot by these teenagers obviously it's uh it's a soft spot <laughs> you know? and uh you know, you have a guy who who that's all he's got, and he immediately sets off on this quest to get, uh, you know, both an answer why this these kids would have done it, and 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 some sort of justice. Um, but you you kind of quickly start to realize that there's a little bit more to the story here, and yeah. uh, you know, eventually when you sort of find out what happened to his his own family, you start to realize that it, it might not just be. Um, revenge or justice against the lead teenager who shot his dog uh, it might actually it's also sort of being being balanced by this need to save this kid from mm-hmm. a fate that he seems to be sliding towards that is is very similar towards what happened to his son so yeah. you know the 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 antagonist is also kind of the person he's trying to save um and it's all you know it's all very below the surface and uh and that's one of the things i like about Jack's writing is that you know there's not people talking about this stuff. You just kind of start to pick it up, and, and that's what makes it so powerful. Absolutely. And uh, you know, and then so it's a real, it's a real slow burner um, as this guy sort of grapples with the situation, and it just sort of gets worse and worse and worse. The, the father of the the kid who did it uh, kind of stands by his son, pretty much knowing that that his son is in fact guilty of it, and. Uh, a little bit of a Hatfield McCoy situation starts to creep in. So. Right now, when you're writing it, is it difficult not to put a a face to the characters you're creating? Do you, do you, do you try to picture actors as you're writing? Sometimes I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I don't like to do it very early on because I find that if if you're writing towards one person, then then whatever they've brought to bear creatively in their career, you know, I mean, like I don't want to think of Jack Nicholson for a role and then, you know, find the, the Joker, kind of uh, the dialect of the Joker competing with, uh, you know, one flew over right. the cuckoo's nest. Right, I, right. I don't like to implant anything like that too early. Um, but, you know, I mean, th- when we were developing the project, we there was a very, very short list of of people that we knew would be perfect for the role, you know. Um, mm-hmm. he, he was actually even a little bit older in the original draft. I think he was in his early 70s. And, uh, you know, there, there was a, you know, you're talking Paul Newman and... <laughs> Yeah, you're talking two or three people. It's not a very right. long list, but but Brian Cox was was always there. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it's, you fantastic. Know, he's just, uh, we have a call. Yeah. We, we have a caller. Uh, let's take this call real quick. Let's see if this is a question for you. Uh, caller, you're on the air. Hello. Caller, are you there? Hello. Okay, I can hear him. I can hear him breathing, but uh, nothing. For a second. Let me see. Let me see. Caller, you're with us. I, I, I see Push Shrink K911 is the identity of the call. Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, I can hear you, buddy. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I had my mic muted. I think. That's okay. You got um, a question? Yeah, I got a couple of questions. I just let go a uh, a screenwriter uh, to do the screenplay on my book because he misrepresented himself and. Uh, the book, I've got two or three fairly well-known comedians and actors that want this book made into a movie, so I'm shopping around for a screenplay person, and it's based on true events. It's a real book. It's a real thing, and I lived it. So I'm trying to uh, find somebody that's not going to misrepresent themselves uh, to write about my my book and my life here. Right. You know, I've got a lot invested in it. So, So what's your question? Uh, how can I get a reputable person that wants to write a screenplay that's going to be made into a movie? My my publicist has already told me that she's got two studios sniffing around. If I can get a decent uh, screenplay written about it, okay. there won't be any problem making the movie. Okay. How, how about that, Stephen? How do you, how, if you're searching for a screenwriter, what kind of quality should qualification should you look for? Well, I think that. Uh you know, there, there's sort of two things that you're looking for. One is one is that you're looking for someone who is a talented writer, and I think that that's the easier part because you can read whatever material they've generated um, and make that judgment yourself. Um, temperament's not a bad one too. If, if 
uh, if you're concerned about how they're going to represent you, it might not be a bad idea once you've found a writer who who seems like a good candidate to meet them for a cup of coffee and uh, you know pick their brain and, and see if you guys can get a good relationship. Uh, if you mean the other side of reputable, which is that they've had a certain amount of success, um, you know you could you could go to IMDb and see if they have any produced credits. Um, if they don't, um, you can just do a little bit of digging. You know, the, there's a there's a there's a system called Studio System, uh, which is sort of an industry database which lists a lot of writers who haven't been produced, but all of the professional jobs they've been hired to do. So you can mm-hmm. find out if um, if they've been ever hired by a major studio or, or a major producer to develop material. Um, yeah. If they have an agent and it's a, it's a, a a larger agent, um, you know, I think that immediately. You can immediately assume that they have some kind of uh, some some good qualities. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Is there any advice that you give to the uh, the fledgling screenwriter out there? I mean, we've spoken of perseverance and having a tough skin. Oh yeah. Well, you know, if you've got five hours, I can. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've you've got you've got about two uh, minutes. You got two if minutes. You can do that. that. <laughs> perseverance is huge, and and. Uh, you know, I think to to generate a, a lot of material, um, and you know, for two reasons: one, because the more you do it, the better you get, and and also because you find that a lot of new writers will write that one script that they continue to shop and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, and years go by, and it's the only thing that they've got, uh, and that doesn't help you. It's, I mean, it doesn't help you creatively, but it doesn't help you business-wise too, because if if someone reads a script that you've written and they, it's not for them, but they like the writing. Their immediate question is, "What else do you have?" And mm-hmm. if you don't have anything else, you've sort of missed your opportunity. Um, whereas if you have five or six other scripts, they'll read all of them if they like your first one. Right. You know, on top of the fact that Hollywood is just it's very frivolous, you know, and you never know when things are going to happen or how they're going to happen. It's, right. it's a bit of a crapshoot. And mm-hmm. If you sit down at the roulette table with with one you know one chip, then you know then you've got one number covered. But if you you sit down with ten chips or fifteen chips, your odds are going up that you know that one script might end up in in someone's hands that that might say I like this writer, let's bring him in for a meeting. You know. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's good to you know refine your craft and 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 increase your odds. Yeah. So what's your release? What's the release schedule here for Red? Well, I believe it's out on video on demand now. I think it came yes. out last Friday, uh, and it's going to come out theatrically. I believe two Fridays from this past Friday, uh, a couple weeks, and okay. it's going to come out in five cities: uh, Los Angeles, New York, Dallas, St. Louis, and um, I think Washington D.C. And uh, you know, it's Magnolia Pictures. It's a smaller rollout, right? And right. it's this new. Um, Thing that some people are trying, where they premiere it video on demand first, and then release it theatrically a couple weeks later, and mm-hmm. hope that it gets uh, a buzz and that people show up at the theater. Right, uh, that's how I saw the video on demand, and uh, it's, a, it's a sensational movie, uh, well, beautifully written, that. yeah, with a great, great uh, roster of performances in it. What's next for you? Uh, well, a bunch of things. Um, I started a production company, and we've got a couple projects that we're we're moving forward with. There, uh, my my partner and I just sold a script called High School, which is a stoner comedy, if you can believe it. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we set it up with uh, Warren Zide, who produced American Pie. And uh, oh, we're, we're waiting for word, but you know we're we're hoping to, to be shooting in October. Um, and we're also producing Zero Dark Thirty, which is um, it's a sort of a reimagining of Bob Clark's Death Dream, which is a movie from 1974. Right, oh, a wow. really re- provocative really cool. uh, horror film. And uh, we're producing that with Michael Douglas, and, and I'm also doing with Michael um, Flatliners, uh, turning it into a TV series. So we're sort of waiting to hear if the studio is going to uh, going to shoot the pilot. We just delivered that. Oh, with Flatliners, a television series of the Schumacher film? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, really we, cool. We turned it into a series, and, and uh, we just turned in the two-hour pilot that's designed to sort of launch the whole thing. And, oh, uh, you know, so we're just waiting for word. We're in that... That place where you just chew your nails and uh, right, right. <laughs> see if it goes forward or not. 